uh, Chairman Kilmer. It's been an honor to work with your committee, the members and the staff over the last two years. And I think I've said a couple of times, without a doubt, in my 20 year affiliation with CMF, this has been one of the most exciting projects that I personally had the opportunity to work on. You talked about the, the importance of bipartisanship and civility. And one of the examples that the committee displayed had a retreat early on in the session. Could you talk a little bit about that and how that helped the functioning and the success of the committee? So um, our committee uh, went to the Library of Congress at the beginning of our process and did a six hour retreat where we kind of talked through what do we want to get done and how are we going to define success? And part of that was a recognition that most functional organizations do that. And so as members talked about what they wanted to accomplish, we started to, there were some threads that we identified that were worth pulling. Different members had different reasons that they wanted to serve on the committee, but there was an overarching theme, which we identified that day, which was every person was serving on that committee because they wanted to make Congress work better for the American people. I think a takeaway from that is there is real value to the extent that it can happen in a bipartisan way on your committees, that the committees have that sort of collaborative discussion on the front end of a Congress to say, here are things we have to get done that we are assigned as a committee. Here are some things that where we might be able to find some common ground. I feel like sometimes Congress is a not entirely super complicated Venn diagram. You know, there's stuff that Republicans want, there's stuff that Democrats want. You know, part of this is simply trying to find the shaded area of things that we can work on together. And each of us has a role to play in that regard. And so that um, also leads me to just for incoming freshmen, some suggestions. As you hear issues in, in committee hearings, you know, certainly if, you, if you're on a committee that does that type of bipartisan retreat, one, recognize that you are a full shareholder in your committee's work and contribute to that. Show up and participate and contribute to it. Two, as your committees meet throughout the course of a year, sometimes you hear someone testify and they say something interesting where you go, maybe that's a thread we could pull. To the extent practicable, there are real opportunities when you pull those strings with someone from the other side of the aisle. So we did that. You know, we would have a, a hearing related to, for example, the congressional calendar. And afterwards, William Timmons, who was a freshman from South Carolina, said, I would like to work on that. That was really interesting. And I feel like I can dive into that. And Mark Pocan, who was a longer tenured Democrat, said, I would work on that with you. We had other examples where Emmanuel Cleaver and Susan Brooks wanted to work together on issues related to bipartisanship and civility. We had other examples where Rodney Davis and Susan Del Bene at the end of a hearing said, these issues related to technology, that's cool stuff. We want to work on that. And they, they sort of spun out, they self-appointed to work on these issues together. So look for those opportunities in your committee. Part of this is finding those shaded areas of the Venn diagram um, so that you can get something done. Again, even as an incoming freshman, there's a real opportunity there. I want to follow up in your role, not only as the committee chair, but also as someone who moved from the state legislature to the federal legislature. And when you did that, I know you've referenced a couple of times the tools you had at the state legislature that you were surprised you didn't have at the federal level. What were some of the tools that you had at the state level that you wish you had at the federal level and that may start coming online because of the work of the committee? Well, some of it you're already hopefully um, taking advantage of, uh, including things like having a transition staffer. Uh, this is the first time that um, members on the House side uh, are able to do that. And I hope it was helpful to the to the new members. Um, that was a recommendation uh, from our committee. We're also in the process of trying to provide more resources uh, to your offices. Um, you know, things like uh, having a centralized HR function so that as you become a new member, and unfortunately, I don't think you're able to benefit from this quite yet, but it's something that we're trying to get implemented. You know, being able to have a, a centralized HR function so you have a clear sense of what does a congressional office uh, look like? What are the, what's a basic pay band? What should I expect to pay someone who's doing this type of function? You know, Brad's organization, a CMF is very helpful with some of those things and house admin can be very helpful um, with some of those things. But um, I think the institution has some work to do on that front. Same thing on things like technology 
where um, the expectation should be, you know, you get a basic technology suite when you come in. The other thing that I will just share in terms of main differences, a lot of the challenges that you'll find in Congress are have less to do with the rules of the institution and seem to have more to do with the norms of the institution. You know, every bill that I got to vote on or debate in the state legislature was taken up under an open rule, meaning you could have unlimited amendments as long as the amendments were germane to the bill. You don't see that happening here in part because it's too apt for abuse. There's too much in, you know, gotcha by both sides of the aisle. And that's a choice, right? And so one of the choices that we have to make as members of this institution is whether we keep doing uh, that or whether we say, particularly with these tight uh, majorities in both the House and in the Senate, do we try to figure out where we can collaborate better um, and, and do things together rather than just play gotcha politics all the time? That is a choice that each of us has to make and that we as an institution have to make. What are some recommendations for uh, the freshmen in how to engage with the committee and, and uh, share their ideas? Yeah, our intent is if the committee is extended and there's not uh, any official white smoke yet emanating from the Capitol, but we've gotten some promising signs that our work may indeed continue uh, uh, into the next year. Our intent is to have another member day where members who have, you know, listen, each, each new member came here for a reason and you're going to have observations about your ability to, uh, to have impact. And we wanna hear if there are certain barriers that you feel uh, are inhibiting that. Um, our intent is to have another member day. It'll be a virtual member day uh, and to continue to get input from members of Congress because you're, you, are, you are stakeholders, uh, the new members who are on the line, you are stakeholders in trying to improve this institution. And because you come in with new eyes, uh, with, clear, with a clear vision of things even in the transition process, Listen, the recommendations we made around freshman orientation, almost without exception, came from freshmen who had just gone through the orientation process and said, you know, one, uh, uh, we'd like more of it to be bipartisan since, um, you know, you had members saying, gosh, we had Democrats get on one bus and Republicans get on the other. And that seems a little funky. You had freshmen say, I would have a paid transition staffer because, I, you know, I can't just ask someone to take it out of their hide uh, for six weeks. And that's a problem. You had freshmen also say it would be valuable. And we're working on this, too. And we made a recommendation in this space that more and more of the your, your professional development as an incoming member happen on a just in time basis or that or even go online so that, and this is something that Brad and CMF have worked on quite a bit, you know, so that, you know, as we kick off the appropriations process, there's an opportunity to basically like have a training module on what, you know, so what do I need to know about the appropriations process? So I, I would just invite, as you see those opportunities of things that you wish happened different in your transition, or once you hit the ground here, if you see things where you think, this has been funky. What you know? Why why does it work this way? Recognize that, and it's not just the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. There are senior members who want to hear from you and want the institution to function better. I do want to give a shout out to the House leadership and the committee and House administration because the rep rapidness with which they made these changes in the last twelve months is nothing short of amazing in comparison to the way Congress has moved in the past. And, and Chairman Kilmer just identified a couple of them, a couple others that were uh, implemented. The schedule for orientation was actually elongated. And the first four days of orientation were just the freshmen. That was a direct response to the recommendation from the committee for more bipartisanship. The new schedule that Majority Leader Hoyer has just put out for the new year absolutely reflects the committee's recommendation that there be segmented time for committee work and floor work. That has never happened in the institution before. It's an amazing schedule. We're very optimistic. It was Some of the work was started in 2010 by Speaker Boehner and uh, Majority Leader Cantor to change the schedule. This is another improvement. So I wanna you know, really call out the leadership in the House because Folks 
in the past, they didn't quite listen to the membership as well as they are now. It's really been a wonderful breath of fresh air. One question for you when it comes to working with staff, and, and this was something that I would also like to ask of Mr. Davis, uh, if and when we get him, uh, you both have wonderful staff and uh, they, they amplify your effectiveness. Do you have any thoughts or tips on, uh, especially for these freshmen who are about to be recruiting and setting up their own process, as, as Brad would say, setting a course uh, within their offices? Yeah, one, I do encourage people to read Brad's book, uh, the, the CMF book, Setting Course. Uh, in fact, I one of the new members called me and said, do you have any advice? And my advice was get, get a copy of that book and read it because it, it really is, um, valuable, uh, just in understanding what the role looks like. Um, and to me, I had some just very good advice about, you know, you, it's, if it, sometimes Congress feels a little bit like, uh, college, right. It's, you can major in something and you can minor in something, but you can't do it all. And helping define what it looks like to actually be an impactful member of Congress, I thought was laid out very thoughtfully in the book in terms of staff, you know, one, you know, identifying, you know, those uh, basic functions, I think, is something that that book does well and that House admin and existing members can can give you a sense of just what kind of what, what are you hiring to? You know, I always establish some, you know, baseline thoughts around what I'm looking for in uh, in that staff. And, and one is uh, a sense of civil leadership. Uh, an appreciation for the fact that our constituents are our uh, are our boss, and that that needs to be an ethic that's held by every member of our team. You know, not everybody who comes to Congress has managed a team before, and I will mention it is really important to recognize that your team is your team. It's a little bit the isotoner gloves uh, ethic too of you have to protect the hands that protect you. That's that is your staff, and. Um, you know, making sure that you're, uh, uh, you know, providing development opportunities for your staff and a positive environment for your staff is really important, not just from the standpoint of the things you're required to do under law in, in uh, which is, you know, kind of the training that members get in terms of having an office where you don't have disc discrimination or mistreatment of staff, but going, you know, you know, that's sort of necessary, but not sufficient thing for having an effective office. You also have to make sure there's a, a positive environment where people want to stay and work in Congress, because one of the unfortunate dynamics is people aren't doing these jobs for the pay or the glory. They're doing it because they want to make a difference. And so finding opportunities where your team can make a difference on behalf of your constituents and on behalf of our country is really important. I see that we've been joined by Rodney Davis. On the conversation about staff and people wanting to continue their public service, I was singing the praises of a member who is also a staffer who comes to this position as you do, now is the, the top Republican on the Committee on House Administration with a great appreciation of the institution and with an understanding of what it means to be on both sides of that table. Thank you so much for joining us despite the technical difficulties. Over to you. How did Derek stay on to be able to answer questions with you guys? And I gotta give Derek a big shout out. I mean, this is a guy who helped create the committee, Select Committee on Modernization of Congress. When I came to Congress and when I was a staffer, when we have select committees, it wasn't to, to do anything that would make Congress work better. It usually cost more polarization. And Derek and under the leadership of him and Vice Chair Tom Graves, you know, old timer Tom Graves, who's now gone, uh, they really put together a leadership style that allowed all of us to have an in, have input. Uh, I, I was, you know, a lot of my remarks were going to be about technology. And when you move into your office for the first time, don't just automatically inherit what was left because some of these folks may have been using technology that was outdated 10 years ago. So make sure that you go through an inventory and we're gonna work with you and the CAO to ensure that you have the most up-to-date technology. Hopefully your previous member invested in that, but I guarantee you not all did. I had that problem just eight years ago. But utilize today's technology. We have more options for you as a freshman class than we've ever had to use off-the-shelf software, cloud-based software. It's gonna make it easier to, con to converse with your constituents. I want to remind you, that is one of the single most important jobs that you can perform as a member of Congress. Constant outreach and communication and constituent service was really what we focused on 
and it allowed me to be able to have a, a now an eight year career and, and going into my ninth and 10th year in a district that many said I wasn't, I shouldn't have won the first time and wasn't surely going to win the second time. But uh, five times later, now you guys are stuck with me at new member orientation. You're stuck with me being the self-appointed pledge educator to each and every one of you. And I'm going to, before we do some Q&A, I want to say one thing. You all are now about to be sworn in as members of Congress. That day when you raise your right hand and you become one of us, you are now part of the institution that you ran against. So do what you can to make it better. That's what we're all here for. Well, Congressman Davis, as we've said a couple of times, you are a district staffer, um, a district director, um, and uh, one of those people that have made the transition. Um, we have on this video chat here today, both staffers, future staffers and future members. Um, talk to the staffers for a second as a former staffer. What advice would you give them for transitioning into this new roller coaster of a job that is setting up a congressional office? As a, as a former staffer, I... I actually feel bad for those who didn't have a basic knowledge of the institution first. Uh, I came in with a leg up, on especially how to set up district offices, what it was going to take to actually budget your MRA, your member's representational allowance, your budget, so that you could have an adequate amount for the staff that you need and also an adequate amount for the district offices that you wanted to put in your district. Don't automatically take what your predecessor has. Go through with a fine tooth comb that budget and we can get you all that information if it hasn't been shared with you before. But learn and listen to, to those who have been through this. Number one, this isn't rocket science or Derek and I wouldn't be here, trust me. But, but it's, we can make the job easier or we can make the job more difficult. And I know I gave you advice at New Member Orientation to hire a single staffer who has the final say in your office because the last thing you want to be as a member, and it's more difficult as a staffer to give up the control and to not micromanage. I found that out and some of our former staff colleagues still haven't figured that out. But when you become the conflict resolution department in your office, you got no one to blame, it's you, it's your fault. You set it up that way. So from the beginning, set it up correctly and make sure that your district director and your chief somebody's got the final say before it gets to you. And they will, I guarantee you, they will make in almost every case the right decision in conjunction with you. And you will be able to get things done and get the ball rolling. We were able to begin constituent service on day one because we had already planned over the last few months to get rolling. And if you have any questions about that process coming in, please let us know. We are here to help you. We want to answer your questions. We will not get annoyed with your texts. We will not get annoyed with your questions. And if, as I've told you, if it's not a, if it's a dumb question, I'm going to tell you it's a dumb question just because I have fun doing that. But we're going to answer everything you need and help you get started. But you have more opportunities as a freshman in this class than any previous freshman class in this can really hit the ground running. And that's because of a lot of the work that Derek and the ModCom, the ModCom committee did in changing the way your orientation is and in changing your opportunities to have access to different different things uh, to make the house better. Talk to us a little bit about the unusual or new relationship that these new members and staffers are gonna have with the Committee on House Administration and in, indeed the institutional office. But uh, talk a little bit about what advice you have for leaning on the institutional support systems that are there and available that frankly, sometimes freshmen don't know about and find themselves in March or February of, I don't know what office to call if I need to buy a, a, or rent a copy machine for my district office. Give them a little guidance here because this is an incredibly important part that sometimes get overlooked in orientation. You know, Brad, you're right, it does. Um, number one, make sure that you, you reach out and, and ask these questions before swearing in day through your ambassador, uh, who's is somebody on my team on House Admin or somebody on the majority's team on House Admin. You guys have had a lot of, of webinars. You've been in person. You've sat down and listened to so many panels. And I know what you was there, what was given to you is all scrambled. What I'd like you to do is sit down and figure out the process with your chief district director, whom you have, and start identifying areas where you need further answers. 
you can reach out to the CAO, the Chief Administrative Officer contact, and they can give you answers relative to what they are they have jurisdiction over. You could reach out to the architect of the Capitol. They can give you answers of what is under their jurisdiction. But as a former staffer, I will tell you, a lot of times they're going to give you the most bureaucratic answer that only fits within their box of responsibilities. So instead of doing that, I'm going to give you some advice. Call house admin. We're going to be able to at least tell you where these calls need to go to get a final answer from the person or the group in charge within the house. We will, we will troubleshoot and funnel down who you need to go reach out to so you're not just on ping pong of, of, of calls while you're trying to also hire a staff, while you're trying to also meet your new constituents and get ready to get sworn in because you're gonna deal with families that think they're gonna come out in a COVID year and everything's gonna be, the swearing in is gonna be like it always has been. And the difficulty you're going to have over the next few months is probably gonna be more with your family and friends than it is setting up your office because we can make that part easy. I can't fix the family and friend issue because they, they're so supportive of you and want to share in your experience. I do want to add and, and do a plug, and I'll put this in the chat room. You talked about the strain on families and, and friends. Uh, most people don't realize the average work week for a member of the House of Representatives is 70 hours a week. I'm betting the DNC and the RNC didn't include that in their recruiting materials when they brought you all to join this wonderful institution. But the Congressional Management Foundation is offering a training program on December 60th. Because the topic is what to expect for families and friends and for staffers. So my next question, uh, gentlemen, is, is based on what you just touched on, which is the different experience that people can expect as a result of either working remotely or uh, working from home or because of the restrictions of the coronavirus is imposing. Can you touch on how uh, coronavirus has changed your operations and what advice you can have for new members and staff that are going to be setting up a congressional office during a pandemic, which no one has ever done before? You know, the, the, all of the work looks different in the midst of this uh, pandemic. Um, oftentimes when you're in D.C., it's this extraordinary juggling act of running from committee to committee when you're in multiple committees at the same time, meeting with constituents in the hallway because they've done fly-ins. Obviously, that is just not uh, what 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 the circumstances are in the midst of this pandemic. There are still going to be and there need to be committee meetings. Many of them will be virtual meetings, um, but it's a little bit more manageable in terms of being able to work around meeting with constituents because they haven't flown, in my instance, 3,000 miles away to see you with a small window of time. So that 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 is a little bit more um, a little bit more manageable. On the district, it's challenging because so much of this job is trying to familiarize yourself with, with folks in your district. I always think about it as concentric circles, right? There's the people you see all the time and then you try to, you know, part of our goal in our office is to get to those outer circles because I represent everybody in all of those circles. And so, you know, we're constantly trying to find outreach opportunities um, to engage with folks that we might not otherwise have an opportunity to meet and to understand what their priorities are. That is far more difficult in the midst of this, uh, in the midst of this pandemic. And so, you know, it, it is a real opportunity to lean on your outreach team in the district to try to figure out means of engaging with people. You know, it's still valuable to do that process of identifying organizations, stakeholder groups, churches, chambers, rotary clubs, Kiwanis clubs, you know, all of those entities that you would otherwise be meeting in person. A little bit harder with things like company visits while we're still uh, remote um, to go tour the factory floor and shake hands with the workforce. We can't really do that right now. And that is something that hopefully we'll be getting back to uh, too soon. But I would just... Um, you know, lean on your team to be entrepreneurial about identifying new ways, particularly as new members. It is really important for your constituents to know that you are their representative. And that means them being able to put a face to you. And, and so uh, a big part of the job is just finding those opportunities to uh, engage with your constituents in this instance remotely. This is the weirdest year ever. Remember, on March 13th, our job out here in DC 
was meeting on 15 minute increments with constituent groups. We would double stack them and then we'd rotate in between. And then on March 14th, no one wanted to talk to us anymore. And then the advent of Zoom, the advent of WebEx, it changed our lives again. Today, my, my job is consisting of doing virtual hearings and meetings the entire day. So I'm sitting behind a computer. DC as we used to know it does not exist. People don't roam the buildings freely. They don't come into your office. So when you set up an office, you're gonna be like, I need all these people here. No, actually you won't in the beginning because no one's going to be here still in the midst of this COVID fight. So change, that will change though. And I think for your class, that's gonna be the biggest surprise to you because your time is going to get even more limited. Mm -hmm. And you need to be prepared for that because your time in the district is going to be much different. Your family is going to have expectations and your friends are going to have expectations that are artificially set right now by COVID that are going to change overnight as we move back into a sense of normalcy. And I think you need to prepare your staff for that if they don't have pre-COVID experience here on the Hill or working in the district, because that's the time that they need to really talk to some mentors and understand what their world's going to look like and in turn what your world's going to look like when we return when we return to normal.